Good evening, Fred and Sorors. Uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to uh, present uh, some thoughts uh, on this topic, uh, which uh, I'm named the game of life. Uh, but it really is uh, kind of looking at these, uh, some principles that likely are useful. That I'd say we've come to know and understand through our Rose Gushen studies uh, about, uh, about life. And, and the reason why I kind of title this the game of life is because in, in many ways, uh, for most of humanity, most human beings, uh, they likely, and perhaps before you, you know, got acquainted with uh, the Rosicrucian Order or other mystical teachings, uh, you found yourself or they find themselves in the middle of this experience, this kind of live game, so to speak, uh, and with really, without an understanding of, of what's going on in it. Uh, uh, it seems to me very much like being, uh, coming to watch a, some sort of uh, game, athletic game, other kind of game, and trying to make sense of it uh, if you haven't, uh, you know, been introduced to uh, really the, the objectives of the game and the rules of the game. And uh, I think that's, the case, unfortunately, for the overwhelming majority of humanity is uh, we kind of find ourselves in this experience called life. Uh, the stakes seem fairly high uh, and don't really have too much understanding of uh, what, what are the rules of the game? How is this thing organized? What's the objective? Uh, religion uh, kind of in many cases, plays this role of suggesting to people what they think is, uh, you know, going on behind this experience that we call life. Uh, but for, you know, I think much of humanity, the nevertheless is not confidence uh, in in what's being shared with them. In part because obviously they're contradictory things when you compare it across religions. Uh, you know, do's and don'ts can be in, in exact opposition in some cases, though there are some universal, uh, uh, fairly universal uh, thoughts uh, across them. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, people uh, nevertheless have to struggle their way through and not with, without the certainty of what is going on. Uh, so to me, uh, you could easily equate it to a game where you uh, you know, you come across it, but in order to participate successfully in the in a game, right, you must know the objectives of the game and, and the governing principles of rules. And, and without that understanding, and this is I think just really the case with life for mo for most people, the play on the field uh, will seem confusing. And as a player on the field, one will not be successful, right? Uh, now, the good news about uh, this game of life is that everybody wins. There are no losers, everybody wins. So that's uh, uh, the good news. Uh, and, and actually the only pe person you have to beat in this game is, is your lower self, All right? So there are no losers, everybody wins in reality. And the, the real other, the real competition really is looking at how to incorporate, transcend uh, and, and kind of, uh, truly incarnate the spiritual self, the soul, uh, uh, and its expression uh, through one's you know, kind of mundane everyday existence. Uh, so in looking at, at kind of guiding principles, uh, what, what, what's the value? I mean, ultimately, uh, we need to know where we're going and how best to get there. And uh, I think what we kind of take away from our studies, our Rosicrucian studies, our own inner pursuits of, of, of kind of the mystical journey and our own, you know, seeking the, seeking the answers to life. And, and that uh, saying uh, that's been put in many different ways, different languages, uh, knock and, and the door be opened, you know, seek and you should find. So for people who have taken this on, whether through something like Rosicrucian studies or otherwise, uh, to come to awareness of what's the goal. And I think our 
Rosicrucian studies, as well as you know related things, uh, basically point out to us, I think you call the goal as the awareness and identification with the immaterial nature of our being, instead of the physical material aspect of ourselves, uh, which is really just an outer envelope for the expression of being or consciousness. So this awareness and identification with the immaterial nature of our being, we call it the soul uh, quite commonly. And that's instead of the physical material aspect of ourselves, which is just an outer envelope for the expression of being a consciousness. And if we think about it, most of humanity has it backwards, right? I mean, through no fault of our own, uh, because it's, it would surely seem to be an evolutionary process for all of us, but not simply the physical evolution, but a, a, an inner evolution as well. But most people think that the goal of life, uh, the objective is centered around the physical material aspect of themselves. Uh, kind of related to this in terms of uh, our goals and aspirations is instead of being principally being conscious of the objects of consciousness, basically the things that our senses bring us, uh, it's becoming more conscious of consciousness itself, of which is being. So, and, and the last point I'd make around this in terms of, you know, guiding uh, goals and, and uh, is knowing and understanding our goal enables us to identify and understand obstacles in our path and ways to accelerate our progress, right? So unless you know your goal, uh, you really are not going to uh, understand and, and address the obstacles in your path and, and to accelerate your progress. So, you know, that's kind of the background uh, to what I uh, wanted to share with you, just some, some principles, some ideas around things that one can I think come over time to observe to be uh, I don't know, features of life, of this existence that we call life, this certain conscious existence of earthly experience. And, and I would say one of the overarching things is to recognize that life is intelligent, All right? So life is, this intelligence uh, permeates all that there is, all that we're conscious of, as well as those things that we're not conscious of. But this intelligence, uh, is, is the foundational piece uh, of life or the expression of life. And we just see it through the, the innumerable life forms. We see the same intelligence. So we live in a sea of life, live in a sea of intelligence. And if you kind of recognize that uh, the cosmic order is this intelligence in action, uh, this intelligence is our own expression of of uh, and and responsiveness to our environment and the thoughts that we're able to entertain. So, uh, this intelligence and in, in, in the kind of the words of Psalm one hundred thirty nine is everywhere, right? No matter how far into the ocean I go, no matter the highest mountain, etc., uh, thou art there. So this this life, uh, and I don't mean the idea of the breathing life, uh, but this notion of, of existence is intelligence. It, it permeates everything. We live in a sea of intelligence. In, in the words of uh, St. Luke, uh, the Christian St. Luke from the Acts of the Apostles, described it as that which in we live and move and have our being. So life is permeated by a universal and imminent intelligence. It's all about us. And it accounts for the universality of it accounts for the precision of karma, uh, the uh, you know the, the regulation of our bodies, the regulation of things in the universe. It it is uh, these cosmic laws are this intelligence in action. They're not uh, you know it's not like a cosmic law is some sort of you know physical object that you pick up, right? These cosmic laws are this intelligence uh, in action uh, in our bodies, in our own awareness, and in the material universe that we see. 
And life, as we know, is responsive, right? One of the things that we say when something's alive is it responds. And, and this life, whether it be the life that you can see manifested through material forms or not, this life, this intelligence is responsive. It's a responsive to every one of our thoughts, our desires, our actions, uh, both individually and collectively. All right, so, uh, you know, when again, we go back to the idea of karma, uh, karma is the responsiveness of this life. And, and you know, I'd say one of the great indications of the imminence of it is the precision of karma, of how when it comes in, I don't mean, you know, it doesn't have to be what we consider to be unpleasant uh, kind of uh, karmic uh, actions or reactions, but you see how exact it is. It is exact to to the cause. You know, uh, we're cautioned, I guess, in the old Jewish Old Testament, it says, you know, and I'm sure it's in, in many other, uh, you know, uh, holy books, is vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And and the idea of all of our, our justice is going to be in, inexact. The cosmic, the karmic, quote unquote, justice balancing, correcting, it's precise, it's exact. And it does it without harming those things around it. So it's, it's kind of the ultimate laser focus. It's for you. Right? It's exactly for you. Whereas you know, when humans try to carry these things out, uh, you know, there, there are consequences uh, beyond the initial kind of motivation for the act. Right? We kind of go at things by comparison with a bit of a sledgehammer as compared to the precision of, of, of this cosmic intelligence. And it, it's not like perhaps when we were children, we may have thought of the idea of God somehow watching all, well, at least when I was a kid, six and a half billion people, perhaps, right? But all eight billion people, God's watching them all individually, et cetera, et cetera, and keeping track. And I guess it's got a giant, you know, a, you know, blackboard up there and writing stuff on it, et cetera. And, uh, you know, then kind of picks out, uh, I guess, what to do. Uh, if you imagine instead that the whole thing is intelligent, it's all intelligence, right? You see, I mean, in, in scientific terms now, they would call that distributed processing, right? It's not just in one central thing, just like in our bodies, right? They're estimated to be 37 trillion cells in our bodies. Uh, we are not individually trying to keep track of 37 trillion cells, and their actions and all the other things that they must do to, you know, keep harmony in themselves and stay in harmony with the, the larger uh, cells and culture around in the organism. So this intelligence is distributed. Uh, it's imminent in all things. And I, I love the, the modernist phrase, uh, the universal but unmanifest force invisibly diffused throughout the whole. All right, the universal, unmanifest, you can't see it but invisibly distributed throughout the whole, right? So it is, It is. where Where can I go when you are not there? You know, we get back to the Psalm or in that which in which we live, move and have our being. You also see, if you look at the accounts of individuals who have, you know, experienced a, either momentary or sustained uh, things of cosmic consciousness, one of the identifying hallmarks that have generally been associated with this and used as a hallmark of cosmic consciousness experience Right, is the realization that we exist in a sea of intelligence. No, it's it's all intelligence. And that's that is why our thoughts and, and our actions, and considering like the eight billion of us humans, not to mention the animals and other things, right? All thinking, having emotions and thoughts and all that stuff, you know, how would how does it keep track of it? What I might ask. Well, it's because this intelligence is 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 universal. It's with our breath, it's everything. Uh, so, uh, keeping in mind, so we, there's no hiding from this intelligence, and it's not because it's God up in the sky, right? Uh, you know, we are part of it. It is part of, it is what makes us up. Uh, you know, the Marnus term is, is for, for God is omneity, the everything, right? Omni, the all, the everything, right? So this, uh, the first thing to keep in mind is we live in this sea of intelligence. We are constantly 
inhaling and exhaling in this sea of intelligence. Uh, so everything we do, every thought that we think, all kind of take place uh, in this sea of consciousness, this intelligence that kind of governs the order of all things. <clears throat> so uh, let's, you know, say good to keep in mind. Uh, another one of these principles, uh, and, and you know what, I, let me get to my screen sharing part here. Thank you. Got a little, da, 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 da. Okay, here we go. Life is intelligent. We just did that. So another one of these principles is the material world is a world of forms. All right. uh, change governs all forms. All right. How we look today uh, isn't the same as how we will look 10 years from now. Right. What is progress today will be grossly out of date tomorrow. What is ascendant today will be unimportant tomorrow. Right. All forms are transitory. The material world is, is a world of forms. Right. So it kind of tells us don't latch on uh, to the forms. Right. Uh, and the, the Master Jesus had an excellent uh, point that way he had of expressing this. He said, uh, do not store up your treasure where rust and moth corrupts, doth corrupt, right? So if you were holding on to the, all those iPhone number fives, thinking, oh, I'll keep these, these are valuable. Well, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, not worthy uh, any longer of landfill, right? So, uh, you know, we want to recognize that uh, all the things we see outside of ourselves are constantly changing. We may not recognize the change immediately because the changes can be slow and somewhat imperceptible to our visible, you know, to our eyes and our observation. But when you come home to it or you, you know, look at it five years later, 10 years later, you're like, wow, that was so important five years ago. And now who thinks of it? Right. So keeping in mind that this material world is a world of forms and by their nature, they are transitory. So, uh, you know, it, it we we need to look at the permanent, not the impermanent. So, but there is a, a very kind of important thing about form, and, and this is the way that being expresses itself, right? So, uh, you know, we, we think about that. Uh, in our Rosicrucian ontology, uh, we hear in convocation, being was without reflection and therefore formless. Right? So being took sentient form, right? Form is the way being expresses itself. Right? Uh, we can't see it except through its expression. Right? So form conditions the expression of being. Right? Uh, if we look at it, the vast array of, of living creatures and entities, uh, we, they're countless and innumerable. Each of those is an expression of being. It takes on these various and sundry ways of expressing itself. So uh, we need to recognize that all of this is being and expression. Right? There's nothing but being, but this is how being expresses itself to our our. Uh, sentient awareness. There are other ways of being aware of it also that, let me say, outside of the senses, but they are sentient, but not determined by the senses. So again, we want to keep in mind that uh, the destiny of all forms is to break down, right? But being expresses itself through forms, right? Being without, reflect without reflection and therefore formless, right? So the unmanifest becomes the manifest, uh, but the, the forms are like a kaleidoscope, ever-changing. The right? thing is, is obviously not to become attached to the, to the forms. Now, uh, this perhaps is maybe one of the, you know, from my vantage point, uh, one of the most important uh, thoughts around this that, uh, you know, I feel at, at least in, like to share. Uh, and that is awareness of that which does not and so we can look at, we just said forms, material things are constantly changing, they're transitory. So 
the question I kind of say we, we could consider is what hasn't changed during our lifetimes? It's not our appearance. It's not where we lived. It's not even our friendships. And in most cases, not our loved ones. Some are here and some are not any longer. So the, the question might be, why do we cling to things that we can visibly see will not remain the same? So if you look at one of the, uh, I think uh, most people would say that the most uh, profound things that we learn through the teachings of the Buddha, right, is do not become attached to forms because they change, right? So then we, what is useful to do when, since we kind of, let's say, own that, is to look at what hasn't changed. What's the one thing that hasn't changed in our, in our lives? And that's that point of realization, the I am, being. That's the one, that's the motionless mover, the eternal cause of all, the thing in the center that is still, is the I am, being. That's who we are. That's who you are. That's who I am. That's who we are. So being is the only constant. It is actually the only actuality. Uh, Descartes kind of got at this uh, with his uh, meditations, which he concluded with saying, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Right? Uh, that's the only absolute known. Everything else can be pushed to the side and questioned and dismissed because if you question it thoroughly enough, you will see it's just a transitory thing. But the one thing that is the unchanging part, that is the same as when you were two years old, is the I. And that I is the expression of the cosmic. That is being. We share being in being you know the the uh thing again this from the the uh kind of judaic christian tradition where we're told be still and know that i am god it's it's in that going within when we actually are just resting in being not looking at what we're doing tomorrow not dealing with the sensory things that being is the eternal That's the, the part that you know, survives the transition, the very many transitions we have in life, right? We have our bodies are very different than when they were when we were five and six years old. And you know, uh, it's conventionally said that our bodies, uh, uh, the cells in our body change over every seven years or some process like that, right? But we are the same person. The, the eye is the same. The locus of awareness is the same. So that that's that's the who we are, and that's the the doorway, right? Uh, to to quote Louis Claudius and Matan, the the door by which God goes out of itself, it enters the human soul, right? And the door by which the human soul goes out of itself, it uh, enters the understanding, that awareness. So, you know. Uh, that that awareness is the unchanging aspect of ourselves. Uh, that that's the actuality of ourselves, and that's the thing we want to dwell in, right? As we get to know self, truly is the only the only constant, the only absolute. Everything is just simply an experience in consciousness or being. Even my voice, this experience you're having now, experience I'm having now, are just experiences in consciousness. Right? We learn in our Rosicrucian teachings there is no space. Everything we don't, we may believe we are seeing and touching things outside of ourselves, but they're just experiences in our consciousness at the end of the day. And with the right stimulation of, of parts of the brain, uh, you could replicate that experience. So ultimately, even this reality is just an experience in consciousness, which is basically what Descartes' meditations were going after. And then concluding, the only thing that he knew could exist with certainty 
is that if he was thinking or feeling, he must exist. And so uh, we, we want to turn our consciousness in to dwell upon that. Another principle I uh, wanted to share is, is that the laws of the material world uh, versus the higher laws of the spiritual world, right? So forms are transitory, the material world. Consciousness is eternal outside of time, right? So there's one of the you know, distinctions. Uh, forms kind of respond to the law of death. They come and go versus the laws of kind of life or consciousness. Uh, this, the, the laws of the material world really are centered around things breaking down, right? It's kind of basic physics, something called entropy. Things go to break down into the most random configuration. Uh, when we apply the laws of consciousness of the spiritual aspect of ourselves, of our being, and we kind of move our attention and intentional resources from that part from, from the material set, side of self and objective side of self to this other part, uh, we see that uh, things are built up. Uh, it brings order to our life, to our world and, and those things about us, to our lives. So there's a, a, a great power in focusing on <clears throat> our spiritual nature of being as compared to our material identity. The more we turn that consciousness in, the more that we dwell in awareness of this spiritual aspect of ourselves, we will see actually uh, uh, that which seem, would seem to be miraculous and virtually impossible from an objective point of view take place in our lives, take place around us. So you know, our, I think our goal is, while we have to live in the material world, is not to be uh, preoccupied with it as the primary kind of seat of our awareness, the primary thing that draws our attention. Because when we do, when we live by the material world, we live by the laws of the material world, world which are uh, very much around things breaking down and, and a good deal of very transitory. And, and with that building up and breaking down, it, it's, it can be very uncomfortable. As we turn our awareness uh, toward our spiritual self, the soul consciousness in us, paying attention to it. Look, you don't, it doesn't have to be a revolution overnight, just in a sense, communing with it, communing with conscious awareness of it, right? Attunes you. I would say a lot of our Rosicrucian exercises, right? They are designed to attune us with this other aspect of self. And, and likely many people, uh, you know, have encountered where, Sometimes uh, where it's been recommended to us, where, where things are, might be very inharmonious around us, we find ourselves in some physical circumstance which is quite inharmonious and perhaps cannot immediately leave it, uh, is to you know, use our Rosicrucian tools, uh, which really, uh, and it can be the Rosicrucian sign that we make mentally, it could be other things, but simply becoming aware of our spiritual nature which is what those things bring us back to. Uh, and when I say spiritual, let me just say the, you know, the soul nature, right? Spiritual may have a lot of different ideas surrounding it, but this aspect of soul, of who we are, this connection to an extension of the eternal, just reminding ourselves of that brings about uh, a certain uh, effects in our lives and our immediate surroundings. So the more we uh, kind of keep our eye and attention focused on that aspect of our, our nature, uh, we see the more harmonious life becomes. And that which will seem like, uh, seem so things to happen so beyond the odds of happening hap will happen in our lives regularly. Right, the things that demonstrate that order that harmony, uh, uh, I, I was having a conversation last week with a young woman who's uh, you know, on her own journey, a mystical journey, and uh, she was describing how 
you know, by by kind of spending the time working internally, that how life had brought things to her. And and she described, she used the term with a bow on them. All right. Uh, and that really is the fruit of the higher governing the lower. So as we turn our tomb into this higher aspect of self, we'll see that the material world, consciousness brings order, right? You pull consciousness out of the body, the body breaks down, right? right? As soon as life leaves the body, consciousness largely leaves with it, soul connection to it, the body breaks down. Consciousness brings order. And as we really turn our inward attention inwardly toward our consciousness, we'll, we'll see it manifest those ways uh, in our life. Uh, I guess the, uh, uh, this this one is actually is as important as the prior one, so maybe I, I misspoke there. But anyway, uh, this principle of unity, and you know, we think all things, all things, all forms of expression are forms of expression of the same divine essence, and are therefore one. And this is you now I would say is likely the most important uh, principle to recognize. Uh, it is all one. We are connected with all expression of life and, and reality. And uh, no different than, than being cells in a larger body. If we only act on behalf of ourselves as a cell, right? And we act to the detriment uh, uh, because in a very myopic way, we just go and, and further our own experience and expression uh, we 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 damage we will damage the organism right that's cancer in the body of sorts right but if we live our lives that way but at the same time what you will find is this cosmic essence this cosmic intelligence just like it does in the body it will go look to basically uh, dissolve remove eliminate that which brings this kind of uh, uh, disunity in 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 harmony so if we try to understand that all things are connected. It's all an expression of the same thing. No different than, I guess, an infant doesn't uh, you know, realize their foot is a part of their body until they bite it, right? They get kind of put, you know, do their best to bite it by putting their little toe in their mouth, right? They go, oh, wow, that hurts. Well, it's part of you, yeah. We do not realize uh, very, to any meaningful extent, our connections with others and we begin to feel it through our heart and very often obviously through our families and then it can become larger but when we recognize that god is one it is all one uh we then conduct ourselves differently uh or we move toward conducting ourselves differently it, it obviously there's you know you got to beat that other opponent which is kind of the material self to some degree in this game uh it has its own influence but you move toward that uh, uh, expressing the realization of that unity. Uh, very often, people would say this this realization of the unity, this connectedness, uh, we we know is love. Uh, some would say it's the energy. Love is the energy th that unites all things. It's and it, it's the opposite of separation. Uh, you know, in psychological terms, they might say love is the signpost to the object of unity. Right, we feel this great feeling because we are feeling connected. Our unity, we're realizing our nature, right? Which that we are one with all these living things, all these expressions. And as we feel that, uh, you know, that feeling of love leads us there, takes us there, sustains us there, because we're coming. It's like it's like a hungry person enjoying the taste of food, right? Someone who hasn't had food and they realize, ah, that tastes good. Love tells us uh, and reinforces for us uh, this realization of unity. So if we keep in mind that we have to develop away from the self as this myopic, just little me, this, this identification with the physical body, which is limited, right? It has boundaries and borders to it and allow ourselves to uh, you know, basically recognize our connection is surely to all living things, right? 
they're all trying to do what we're trying to do. We're all just, they're all trying to make it, right? Realizing that connection to living things, then we respond. We respond what we call love because we feel that unity, that oneness. And that, that likely is the most undergirding principle of how to succeed at, at this experience that we call life uh, is recognizing the unity and acting out of that recognition. And we know it doesn't come overnight and it's a, it's a marathon, not a short game. It's, it's a game of cricket, you know, it lasts forever, but it's a long game. But as we progressively move ourselves in that direction, uh, we see the fruit of it. So we, we, we want to realize this principle of unity. It, it likely is the most uh, important or salient thing to, to take ourselves on that journey towards, right? Let's, let's, we have to work around the differences in the expression and realize, no, it's one thing expressed in many, many forms. Multitudinous, you know, uh, worries is expressions. Multitudinous was nature. Uh, uh, so don't, we, we, we are distracted by the, the differences in the appearance, but it's all the same thing expressing itself. All right, so uh, something there about that principle of unity. Uh, evolution is a universal principle. Uh, I think we kind of get this just to, you know, focus on a little bit. Uh, that includes the expression of consciousness in living things, right? So uh, it, it's this, uh, this principle uh and and becoming incarnate so when we say incarnate meaning it's you know kind of clearly sharing the uh these other levels of vibration you know in physical form uh, and progressively it expresses more and more of its nature and we know our job as we say the unfolding of the rose right is expressing progressively the nature of the soul which is is aware of of its oneness uh, and we become aware of its oneness and it's part of that that one divine principle. So there's this evolution. It moves us away from the transitory to the eternal, right? Uh, and life is constantly moving us away from, quote unquote, false gods. A false god can be anything. It doesn't, not a statue. It can be something you, you know, become so materially fixated on that now you're, you're instead of doing the work you're really here for, which is to you know, bring about the expression of your soul through, you know, your body and yourself and your personality. And instead, you know, you're focused on something else. Uh, so the other beautiful thing about this is that free will, which humans exhibit it to a, a, a definitely a distinctive degree, it may be present other living creatures on earth as well, not to mention the things outside of earth, but free will enables us to either resist or speed up this process of spiritual evolution. Right? We can actively participate. I mean, that's one of the great gifts that we as human beings have. We're able to actively participate in our evolution. Either way, you're going to evolve. There's no question you're going to evolve. Evolution governs all kingdoms, right? including this kind of expression of, of, of in humanity of this soul nature. Uh, but we have an opportunity through free will to advance that uh, which actually makes a much more pleasant human experience as well. So this evolution, uh, it was said by Marcus Aurelius, a Neoplatonist, who basically said, those who will not walk voluntarily, the fates will drag. And that's really just pointing out this evolution is going to go. You can either cooperate with it uh, and really take advantage of the time we hear on Earth in this earthly consciousness to accelerate this evolution, uh, or you can resist it. But uh, generally resistance is, is fairly painful. So not, not highly recommended. Uh, we're getting there, there. Uh, sorry. Uh, we're at number eight. There's going to be 10, a couple more to go. So consciousness determines our experience, right? As you shift the balance of your consciousness toward awareness of your spiritual, uh, immaterial aspect of your being, your life will move away from seeming randomness and intermittent harmony to, to sustain harmony. Right. So as we shift our conscious toward awareness of the spiritual and material aspect of our being, we will see that uh, we are not subject to the random things uh, that uh, you know, beset a lot of lives, right? And they're because they are 
uh, vulnerable to those things, susceptible to those things because of the lack of harmony in their existence, uh, lack of attunement. Uh, and uh, this reminds me uh, of the story of the prodigal son. I think there's a connection there where uh, you know, originally the, the 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 son of the wealthy guy, he goes, you know, he's got all this wealth. He says, "I want my money." Takes it and goes off, and you know, things go downhill. And eventually, he's eating with the pigs. And then the the line uh, is, "He came unto himself. He realized his own nature, right? And then, upon that realization, right, eventually returns to the home, to the principle from which he comes." And you know the celebration and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you know we have that opportunity. We can use our free will to uh, accelerate this. And and as, as we, the more we stay in this awareness of the spiritual aspect ourselves, it underlies reality because that's what's behind reality. Right? There's this intelligence, this spiritual intelligence behind reality. We can, we'll see how reality will be organ will organize itself in response to that in, in a way that manifest harmony for us. And and one of my favorite uh, illustrations, and I, I you know shared this before, but I just bring us back to it. Uh, as it seems to me, for those who, you know, you might have to go Google this if you're not familiar with the lapidary, but basically it's how they, you know, polish stones and that we're all kind of in this lapidary tumbler, which is a canister that turns very slowly with a lot of stones in it, a bit of grit and a little bit of like fluid, and the stones polish one another. Right, and that thing may turn for 30 days straight, 24 seven, very, very slowly, very, very slowly. And then after those 30 days, they open the canister up, they kind of empty out the water, they kind of rinse out the grit, they take out the stones that are still very rough, put them to the side, and then put finer grit in, right? More water, close it back up, and then it turns again. So the fine stones continue to polish the other fine stones, but the other, the more coarse stones are removed because they would damage the fine stones. And they go back in to be in another lapidary where they're again rubbing kind of to bring about this uh, this uh, evolution and development. Uh, karma is our feedback loop, right? Uh, and we do know, I think we've all actually observed that the pace of karma speeds up now that we're on the path. And we're very fortunate. You know, we are really blessed. I mean, the reality is we really are blessed. Uh, the other good part, though, is that you being blessed or anyone being blessed doesn't take away from an opportunity. For, everyone can be blessed. We all are, in the words of Samatan, we're all assembled around the circumference of a circle. We all have different circumstances to our lives, but we are all equidistant from that spiritual center. So every one of us, by turning there, uh, can have the same experience. It doesn't take away from anyone else. And the last uh, point I would make, and I'm sorry I'm, I'm so over time, but... Uh, is this from Louis Claude de Samatan, who again, you know, one cannot love his stuff too much, I, I suspect, but uh, each person's life is an individual puzzle with its own unique answers. And that's truly why we have to study our own lives, right? And see what is life teaching us, what is life is telling us at a given moment, right? To look at how we uh, evolve. We're not expected, we don't, it doesn't all happen overnight. It's an evolution. And, and our beloved uh, former imperator, Ralph Lewis said, he said, evolution, not revolution, leads to lasting change. And that's what happens with us, right? But we have to search and look at our own lives and look at those things that are next in our life to, to help us evolve. So uh, that's really the presentation for this evening. Uh, so a little late there, but uh, I hope uh, you found it somewhat of some use or some parts of it and all. So uh, God bless and uh, take good care. Peace profound. Uh, and let us all just, you know, give thanks uh, to uh, being able to have been lucky enough to put our feet on this 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 beloved path of the Rosh Krishna Amor. God bless. <laughs>